So I'm David Holtzman, president of the Louisa County Historical Society. I'm sorry, I'm not used to a microphone. Thank you so much for coming. It's a wonderful crowd. We're so glad to have you. And thank you so much, Pastor Jones and the congregation at First Baptist for welcoming us here today. So this is really happy to be here. Uh, I'm just going to say a few comments briefly about our speaker and then turn it over to her. Uh, Shunnett Garrett Scott, a native of Texas, is the Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Mississippi. Her research focuses on race, gender, and capitalism. Her first, first book, Banking on Freedom, Black Women in U.S. Finance Before the New Deal, published by Columbia University Press in 2019, is the first full-length study of the elite sector of U.S. banking that centers on black women. It focuses on the St. Luke Bank of Richmond. Uh, Banking on Freedom recently won the 2019 Woods Brown Prize for the best book in black women's <coughs> history. Uh, Ms. Garrett Scott is a past recipient of a number of prestigious fellowships for her research, including from Princeton, Harvard, and Duke universities. She's currently in residence at the Library Company of Philadelphia as its short-term Mellon Fellow in the Program of African American History. She's completing an article-length work on racial capitalism and freed women in the 1860s. She's also at work on a new book-length project about modern-day slavery and the informal economy. Uh, and uh, uh, also notable, as some of you possibly may have seen her in the recent PBS documentary, Boss, The Black Experience in Business. So without further ado, uh, I'll welcome Ms. Ms. Shennett Garrett-Scott. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. It's been so exciting. Uh, and so wonderful. So I'm going to talk today about black women's political culture in um, Virginia, then and now, uh, before the 19th Amendment up to the 2020 elections. Is I a suffragist? Yes, ma'am, that I is. I suffragist and right now in these old bones of mine so bad I can scarcely walk. You don't mean that, you say. You want to know whether I wants to vote? <laughs> no, ma'am, that I, I don't. don't. Vote Voting takes up too much time for an old Negro that's got a good-for-nothing husband and seven children to support. Or so went a conversation in late 1914 between old Aunt Jemima and Callie Thomas Ryland, a white woman who wrote for the Richmond Newsletter Society comment, comment, column. Jemima was Ryland's occasional muse, offering up maxims and folk wisdom on all kinds of topics, from motherhood to religion to relationships. It was a silly bit of pretense. You know, the white women readers who chuckled, shook their head, and heaved a great sigh of amusement knew Aunt Jemima was not real, but that did not matter. They longed for Jemima's safe reassurances. They knew, convinced themselves, that black women were too busy running after no good men and unruly broods of children to even concern themselves with complex matters like suffrage. Now, the black women readers probably did not chuckle, but might have shook their heads and heaved great sighs of frustration. Millions of black women had indeed been thinking about suffrage and pondering the power of the vote. Now, the formal ballot possessed a particular kind of political power. It is not a question then of whether, but when black women added suffragists to their crusaders' arsenal, wife, mother, sister, worker, freedom fighter. I actually should have nodded a little bit early. So uh, click one more time. So, okay, in our time together today, I will explore some aspects of black women in Virginia's fight for the boat, vote. So first, I will talk a little bit about Reconstruction, which is the period after the Civil War when black men gained the right to vote, but it was also a critical moment for black women's political culture. Second, I will make a very quick case for why women through their churches, 
their clubs, and their societies, especially societies like the Independent Order of St. Luke, um, embraced suffrage within this constellation of issues that linked citizenship and economic rights for black communities. Then I will highlight some examples of black women in Virginia's suffrage activities in the years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. And then after the passage of the 19th Amendment, I will share some examples of black women voters' experiences of repression and how they fought back. And finally, I will you know, jump uh, forward to today to talk about black women have really become a critical um, voting block in recent elections, but especially to highlight how many of the issues they fought for 100 years ago still resonate today. So I write about black women and money. That's what I study. So uh, my talk will mention how the fight for economic justice was an essential part of the fight for social justice. So economic concerns really, you know, animated and sparked black women's political, you know, considerations. Because even Aunt Jemima, if you remember, at the very end of the quote I shared at the outset of this paper, puts economic concerns front and center. She does, after all, have a husband and seven children to support. So I'm also a storyteller, so I will try to share a little vignette or a little story before some of the sections to help introduce the discussion. Dear sir, I thought it best that I write you to inform you of a vile conspiracy afoot. The Negro Loyal League of this district has been called upon for 100 men to go to Richmond to do a little work for God, as they express it. I have personal knowledge that a number of Negro men have disappeared suddenly in the last two or three days from this place, and others come from a greater distance to do a little work for God. This is their trick. So this is part of a letter written in March 1868 from one white gentleman to another warning him of the machinations, the workings of the loyal leagues, which were also called union leagues. So after the Civil War, blacks around the state of Virginia and all throughout the South became politically active, and they especially organized these political clubs um, that were called lo like the Loyal Leagues. Northerners were the first ones to organize these Loyal Leagues um, during the Civil War, and they did that to show their patriotic support for the Union cause. But after the war, the League spread quickly throughout the South, growing into the largest black political organization in the South. The Leagues counted hundreds of thousands of black men among its official numbers, but women were also active in the Leagues. So after emancipation, black women continued work they began in the hundred years even before the Civil War, work that they were doing as educators, as businesswomen, uh, as philanthropists, both enslaved and free, uplifting and empowering black communities. So they pushed for women's suffrage even as they supported passage of the 15th Amendment and the franchise for black men. So women held loyal league and other political meetings, not only in their homes, but in the homes of their white employers. They attended political rallies. We know because whites remarked negatively on the presence of black women at these political meetings. Black women participated in debates about candidates and issues. They marched in parades. They campaigned and raised money for candidates. They monitored polling places, and they counted ballots. They also shared the franchise. Black women understood themselves to have a vital stake in black, in the, in black men's franchise. The fact that only men had been granted the vote did not at all mean that only men should exercise it. I think it's, 
I think I'm good. A man's single vote expressed then the collective will of not just the women, but also even the children in his life. So black women and children made decisions about how their fathers, husbands, and sons would exercise their shared political power. But blacks' efforts to vote, however, were often met with resistance, and they sometimes had to cloak their efforts, especially during the 1870s, which uh, during a period known as redemption. And redemption is this period uh, when Southerners worked to redeem their states. So they tried to reinstitute racial supremacy. They wanted to purge the Republican Party's influence, and they wanted to turn back blacks' political, social, and economic gains. So in places like Warren County, in Williamsburg, in Norfolk, and or the other places, their tactics, you know, they use all kinds of tactics. Tactics. They range from fraud and intimidation to kidnapping, arson. They especially burned churches and schools. They drove tenants and farmers from the lands. Uh, they beat people and they also lynched people. So women and children as political actors who also went to the polls, participated in parades and mass meetings and expressed openly their um, support for particular parties counted then among the victims and casualties of this violence. So black women then faced considerable physical risk and even death because of their political activities during Reconstruction. So this violence and economic repression of redemption followed by legal disenfranchisement effectively stripped black men, but also by extension, black women of the formal vote. Next section. Come brothers, let us all unite our sisters as the case may be. To stay the hurtful tide against the world will bravely fight and spread our order wide. So for Elizabeth Draper Mitchell, the simple words of that ode held profound meaning. In a decade of freedom from the end of the Civil War to the mid 1870s, she had become a wife, a new mother to a son and a widow. Lizzie had been the enslaved property of Elizabeth Crazy Bet Van Loo, a wealthy Richmonder who spied for the Union Army. In 1864, a Confederate soldier boarding with the Van Loo family raped the young 14-year-old Lizzie, and she gave birth to a daughter she named Maggie Lena. And in my book, I said, uh, a woman she heard some um, call a prostitute, but that she knew walked with God. Elizabeth married William Mitchell, a formerly uh, in, a fellow formerly enslaved man who also worked in the Van Loo household, and she they got married in 1868. And so William gave little Maggie Lena his last name, and the Mitchells moved to a little modest clapboard house in College Alley, where their family grew in 1870 with the birth uh, of a son that the couple named Johnny. But in 1876, the police fished William's bloody body out of the James River. The coroner ruled his death a suicide, but Elizabeth believed that her husband had been robbed and then murdered but there was no justice in the truth that he had been a victim or in the lie that he had taken his own life. But maybe there was a little bit of solace in the words of the independent order of St. Luke's Ode. The young widow would have appreciated some solace to help to stay the hurtful tide that threatened to swallow up her life and the lives of her two small children. And uh, it was, um, uh, so the, the, that small solace included, you know, a little small burial benefit that they used to uh, lay William to rest. And so men with families to protect and to provide for were just the kinds of members that a fledgling society uh, like the Independent Order of St. Luke hoped to attack, uh, attract. But it was also a message that attracted black women as well. So young Maggie Lena would grow up to join her mother's council and go on to lead the, uh, the Independent Order of St. Luke uh, by 1899. 
and she, that is Maggie Lena Walker. So black women who are connected to these kinds of societies often held membership in other organizations. So they were uh, members of churches and clubs and civil rights group and so groups. And so their participation in all of these different kinds of societies, the Independent Order of St. Luke's, um, the Tents, the Daughters of Peace, and the Daughter Elks, they all shared similarities with but differed from their other kinds of memberships. Um, especially in their focus on economic development. So the Daughters of Peace, for example, along with their brothers, opened up the Sons and Daughters of Peace Penny, Nickel, and Dime Savings Bank in Newport News. The Independent Order of St. Luke enjoys the distinction of opening the only bank financed largely by black women and ably led by a black woman, Maggie Lena Mitchell Walker. Secret societies represented this unique site for black women. So the secret passwords and the elaborate badges and costumes were more than just a performance. These elements really shaped members' sense of mission uh, in the larger society. They reflected women's sense of rights and the responsibilities that they held or felt they held as U.S. citizens. So the financial services that they offered and the economic power that they wielded, it's really important to remember, established the foundation that made all of their activities uh, possible, that underwrote the society's um, very existence. And so in, this, in addition to assisting with medical and burial expenses, these societies helped members find employment and they um, helped them um, pay for education and to also purchase homes. So the bylaws and the constitutions and all the workings of these societies was kind of a, a, a civic culture um, that was committed to black self-respect, economic independence, education, and social justice. And this was a culture in which black women actively participated. And it is important to stress that we're talking about all kinds of women, elite women, middle class women, working class women, but these are the women that made up these societies. And so these societies really helped women and trained them in building coalitions, not just across class lines, but also across racial lines. And through these local me uh, meetings, the national conventions, the mass meetings, um, that what they call to address local issues, we get a sense of these women's um, um, interest in justice issues, which included anti-lynching legislation. They wanted to dismantle Jim Crow. They wanted to equalize schools. They wanted um, access to labor and trade unions, and they wanted to create safe and equal workplaces. So the perspectives and priorities then of black women deeply shaped and were shaped by their experiences in these kinds um, of societies. So the women leaders and members of these societies, like I said, saw you know, economic rights as an important way for black women in particular and black communities in general to kind of exercise their citizenship rights. So the passbook or the checkbook and the insurance policy joined the poll tax receipt and the ballot in advancing a vision of economic justice for working women. And this made black women's relationship to the state and national um, movement for suffrage in the 19s kind of a study in contrast. It's, it's really diverse, the kinds of things that they did. So in some states, these women openly supported white women suffragists. So for example, the, the, the uh, United Order of Tents spoke in support of uh, the passage of, of suffrage in New York in the, in the mid 19 teens. But in Virginia, black women participated only marginally in what was clear to them a white woman's suffrage movement. So openly political clubs and organizations uh, if they had those, it would, they would run the risk of being targeted 
for violence and, and uh, repression. So churches and secret societies and schools and clubs then became the primary places where black women addressed these linked political and economic and social and cultural concerns. So you don't really speak necessarily of a black suffragist because suffrage was only really one part of women's political concerns. So actually, I'm sorry, go back. I went too far. Okay, yeah. So uh, the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia stoked fears of Negro domination unless the state enfranchised white women and then quickly disenfranchised new black women voters. So I've not been able to find any evidence that black women organized a, a, a racially segregated branch of the major suffrage organizations in the state. And so that was a strategy that in other states, women use, like in New York and Ohio. But black women really didn't need to do that. What black women did do was they spoke up in their existing organizations, and they spoke up through their donations. They spoke up with their bodies and with their pocketbooks about suffrage, its possibilities, and its limitations. So at the 1912 National Association of Colored Women's Convention, which was held in Hampton, Virginia, the local committee organized a suffrage parade. Uh, so a suffrage parade of black women uh, marching on the Hampton campus. And there was an address, Magdalena Walker addressed that convention and she linked women's political and earning power. She told the audience, capital is death and will never hear black women's cries until women force capital to hear them at the ballot box and to be as just and as honest with them as to the men. So she meant that working women's efforts in the forms of strikes, petitions, even boycotts could only go so far, uh, they, that they were needed, but they could only go so far, um, they were only so effective without the power of the ballot, the power to put people in power who would respond to their demands, whose very power derived from um, the, the, that granted by um, constituents like women. Uh, and that same year, too, Addie Waits Hunton, uh, a daughter of Norfolk, um, discussed equal suffrage in her paper titled Women's Rights. Uh, and she delivered that paper at the 1912 National Negro Business League meeting in Chicago. So black women from secret societies and all these other kinds of groups, they marched in the equal suffrage parade in um, Washington, D.C. in March 1913. Um, now, originally, this is just a little aside, originally the, the organizers had planned for black women to march in a segregated, separate parade. But Ida B. Wells uh, Barnett nipped that in the bud. Um, uh, in fact, I, I, when I was telling my daughter this story, because my daughter is a Delta, uh, Sigma Theta, and so they talk about this parade, and um, and so I told her more about the parade because she didn't really know the history, um, and I and so I told my daughter, well, you know, uh, Ida Ida B comes and 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 I, basically she dare, dares them, you know, they're like, oh, I can imagine they're saying, oh, well, you know, you go over here or over there, and I always think of of of, of her as standing there like, move me, <laughs> like make me, <laughs> um, so. So her critique of the experience, so she openly shared and talked about this experience, um, and it gave Chicago, uh, a, broad, a Chicago Broad X reporter the confidence to observe, uh, quote, white women are trying to emancipate themselves by enslaving colored women. So in the pages of the St. Luke's organ called the St. Luke Herald, the editor Lillian Payne, one of um, uh, Walker's really great friends, wrote in unequivocal terms about racism, sexism, and the vote. Uh, a May 1913 editorial proclaimed, the South is still gathering the vengeance of a just God. A year later, another editorial, these women were not mincing words. A year later, another editorial about suffrage um, commented on what 
for black women had long been uh, um, obvious to them. Um, white women, it said, are afraid lest in striving for the ballot for themselves, they should in some way help the Negro woman. So as president of the St. Luke Bank, Walker made a lot of compromises to Jim Crow, but not without an intentional long-term strategy. So the, a bank, for example, accommodated you know, the rigid lines of segregation. So you could only buy a house uh, in certain areas of the city, but it also encouraged its members to buy homes, but also to, uh, and for councils, which were what the little branches were called, local branches were called, to build or purchase their own um, uh, meeting halls within these same segregated um, uh, neighborhoods. One more. Um, so the bank's finance committee made these um, loan decisions, and they really uh, increased the number of black women homeowners, encouraged them to pay their poll taxes. And so through extensions of the independent order of St. Luke, like the St. Luke b b boosters, which you just saw, um, St. Luke women mobilized black women homeowners to pay poll taxes um, and also to mobilize black women uh, to come out and vote and also to support black women for uh, candidates for public office. And so, and also around the country in large cities like Harlem and Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, and even in small towns like Lynchburg, the uh, St. Luke members built these meeting halls. And these meeting halls provided a space not just for the members to meet, but for all kinds of groups like black political clubs, um, the, the colored industrial and agricultural society, unions, churches to meet, um, to organize, to debate, and to coordinate community initiatives. So long before passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, black women's organizations and the brick and mortar sites that they financed helped promote black women's economic initiatives and their political culture. So um, the Virginia State Legislature never passed suffrage for women, but after passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, its sentiments stood, unfortunately, firmly with the newly enfranchised white women voters. On the floor um, of the legislature, um, politicians declared that it was, quote, of paramount importance to protect the electorate from the colored female voter. Um, end quote. In response, black women wasted no time mobilizing. Walker and Lillian Payne of the Independent Order of St. Luke, along with other activists in Richmond like Aura Brown Stokes, um, who founded the Negro Women's uh, Voters League, helped organize a committee of women to register as many black women as possible before the registration deadline. And Walker, she chaired that committee. They organized mass meetings um, throughout the state and they ended up registering thousands of black women to vote, but they could have registered far more. Segregated lines at the registrars moved really slowly for black women applicants. Clerks routinely challenged black women's qualifications. So uh, Walker and Stokes, for example, pressed the city of Richmond to, to appoint black women clerks after the register hired three white women clerks to handle the hundreds of white women attempting to register each day, but their efforts did not bear any fruit. And black women also faced other kinds of disgraces. In addition to interpreting parts of the state or federal constitution, in, in places like South Carolina, registrars created a special tax um, for black women only that was equal to about $3,800 in modern day dollars. So these people were determined that voting would not only cost women money, but that it was also cost them time. So in Virginia, black women waited sometimes up to 12 hours to uh, register to vote, or they would try several times. They would come, the registrar would tell them to come back you know, later or in the morning. So they would come back and try several times to register only to be told that they did not qualify. And some would turn away just after one attempt. 
So Emma Lee Kelly, who was the founder and grand secretary of the Daughter Elks, and three other women were refused registration. Uh, they lived in Hampton, but they sued the registrar. And so in the subsequent trial, that same registrar who had told them that they were not qualified, well, he didn't accept their answers to the questions, um, he, all, he failed to answer correctly the very questions that he had put to the, uh, to the women. And Addie Hunton, um, and she uh, did an investigation for the NAACP of black women's complaints about the 1920 election in Virginia. And she noted in her report that a number of women she interviewed wanted, quote, not only redress, but in many cases, vengeance. End quote. So registrar clerks treated black women so disrespectfully. Um, and I have to tell you, I have a great imagination and I can try to think of all kinds of you know, things that may have happened, but I cannot imagine what must have happened to this woman for her to say, quote, I could kill the clerk who questioned me. And then I could kill his wife and his children. <laughs> so I do not know what this registrar did to this uh, uh, woman. But black women had reason to feel really bitter and embittered about their first experiences with the franchise. Because immediately after the 1920 election, whites resorted to a well-worn playbook you know, to different disenfranchised black women. They used a lot of the tactics that they had used to disenfranchise black men um, for decades to keep them from voting. They threatened women's livelihoods and their safety. Um, one register refused to allow teachers uh, to register, and then he warned them that if they came back, they would lose their jobs. So most of them did not return. Um, and in some places, they threatened women with arrest if they failed to answer a question correctly. So some women chose not to answer any questions. And there are also with these, um, uh, um, in some states, they proposed um, this grandmother clause. And it was going to be used to exclude black women um, and for some women, it seemed like this was imminent, that it really was going to pass. So I don't know if you're familiar with the grandfather clause that was used to disenfranchise African-American men. Um, Mississippi, you know, pioneered that law. And many other states uh, uh, took, took it uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. But what it basically said was that um, if your father or a grandfather had been able to vote in 1860, then you could vote. But of course, most African Americans were enslaved in 1860, so that kind of disqualified them. Um, but this um, uh, grandmother clause that uh, they uh, were promoting um, was especially, you know, just, just a nasty clause. So it was, was going to require that women procure or, or bring proof of the legitimacy of their birth extending back three generations, that's 60 years. So women would have had to produce a registration certificate saying that she was not the product of an illegitimate union going back at least 60 years. So you can imagine for black women, many of whom have been the products uh, and the victims of exploitation during and after slavery, the clause was clearly designed to keep them from voting and also to shame them. And, 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 and that's to say that uh, white women um, who could not prove the marriage of their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, though really didn't have to worry because like nearly all of the efforts put in place or threatened to be put in place to keep black women and men from voting, registrars could just exempt whites from meeting those same requirements. But I do think that it's important for me to just to mention that um, when it did serve you know, the people in power to keep working class and poor whites from voting, they would make some of these same requirements um, for whites um, as well to keep them from voting. But of course, black women fought back. They held rallies in churches. They wrote letters and petition. 
uh, and women from like for women from the, the society, the Court of Calanthe, which is uh, is really big in Texas, and I studied them. Um, they endorse letters uh, to prominent white suffragists like Carrie Chapman, um, Kat, who suffragists that they felt were sympathetic to them. They formed delegations and they um, established permanent lobbies that traveled to state congressional conventions um, to prevent the, the politicians from including disenfranchisement me uh, measures in state constitutions. So women's clubs, suffrage leagues, church groups, uh, and societies um, like the Household of Ruth, like the Independent Order of St. Luke, also wrote uh, resolutions. Um, so a number of women even uh, from Virginia um, traveled with a group of over 50 women who lobbied Alice Paul of the National Women's Party. Uh, and I do have to say about Alice Paul, um, uh, in all my in the work I've been doing, uh, so I've been looking at um, you know suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Kat and, and others, and uh, have found them wanting when you read their letters um, about how they feel about African American women um, voters. But Alice Paul um, just made it clear that she was not interested in helping African American women whatsoever. So she was never, she was always clear, she was never equivocal. equivocal. Um, in fact, so when this um, delegation of black women you know, went to see her, well, she tried to dodge them. Um, she told them to come on Friday, and she wasn't there, but they showed up the next day, uh, and they waited to see her. And she said uh, she, she did not budge on her sentiments, you know, about black women and the vote, but she did say that it, that group was the most intelligent group of women who ever attacked her. Uh, end quote. So the uh, National Association of, Association of Colored Women drafted a re resolution to the National Women's Party and Mary Church Terrell, the great activist Mary Church Terrell, delivered it in person to the National Women's Party. Um, and, and, and in it, it didn't pass, but in it she stressed, quote, no women in the country need the ballot more than the colored women of the South. They need the ballot as a weapon of defense and protection. And so she linked women's racial, gender, and class concerns. She said, quote, they, they are the victims of lynching, of the convict lease system, system the Jim Crow lines, and of unjust discrimination um, uh, in, in society. So these and other efforts, however, did not result in any revolutionary um, advances. But African-American women learned a lot about out, um, the power and the limitations of the vote from their um, act, um, from their experiences. So you have to ask, why fight um, for suffrage when um, your white sisters are actively working against it? Why fight for suffrage when it fulfills so little um, of its promise uh, for black women? So to the first question, I think that women pursued it because they felt that they believed that political equality among the races would raise the status of everyone, black men, black women, whites, everyone in the country raise their status together, and that suffrage would prove an important tool for dismantling um, lynching, anti-miscegenation, and Jim Crow legislation. Um, but to the second, I had to think really hard, you know, especially because of the contemporary resonance or because um, when you think about, you know, foreign interference uh, in the 2016 election um, and, and part of the reason, part, well, part of that tampering um, was that they that these people were tapping into the futility that many black people felt about the value or the importance of, of voting. But a number of media outlets predict that this year's election will hinge on black women. Um, so the quest to win, whoever's going to win the 2020 primary and general election, um, New York Times, Forbes, so many different um, uh, news outlets are saying it lies with black women because black women of color um, vote um, overwhelmingly uh, in blocks uh, for um, candidates. But, the, the, but what's important really is that the kinds of issues that are important to black women today echo with those concerns of the past. So when black women think of the wage gap, 
They know that they make 63 cents for every dollar compared to their white male counterparts. And when black women think about their health care, they experience uh, that their sisters and mothers die of breast cancer and cervical cancer, heart disease and diabetes at far greater rates than white women and that their fertility is impacted disproportionately by uterine fibroids, premature delivery and inadequate access to reproductive care. And when black women look at their economic prospects, they know they stay to stare down over $10,000 more in college debt than white men do. Overall, um, women hold about, black women hold about $400 billion more in college debt than men of all um, races. So in overall wealth too, black women lag significantly behind. So the issues that have concerned black women have remained consistent over the decades. But despite the obstacles placed in their path, it is clear that uh, women will remain engaged in the political process, that they're fully invested in the emotional, physical, and financial health of, of um, black communities in particular, but the well-being of the nation um, as a whole. And I hope too that the lessons that people take uh, from black women's uh, experience, their political culture, is that the actual vote is really only the beginning. It's really only part of your power, your political power, and we all can learn so many lessons from them, lessons about mobilizing our communities, about educating ourselves on the issues, about lobbying and petitioning politicians, and about addressing um, pressing um, local concerns. So I thank you so much for listening to me um, talk uh, all this time, and uh, I would be so happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes. What you say? I do. I have a book, but I have to tell you that I was um, in Tuskegee uh, last week. And I sold almost all my books, so I only have one book. But I am, <laughs> but I am giving away a book for free to some lucky person here today. So if you look on the back of your program, and it has a little asterisk, little star written in pencil on the very bottom, on the back page. Ah, oh, I see someone back there. Has it? So I have a book for you. Thank you. Yes. And I do. I only have one book that if someone really wanted to buy one, I could give you one. And, um, and then I could also give you, a, anyone who was interested, a code and they could um, get one. Yes, it's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's called Banking on Freedom. So if you just do Banking on Freedom, you should find it. Yes. But, but I will give you a, a discount code. You can't use it on Amazon, but you can use it on Columbia University Press's site. You can save 20, 30%. Oh, I guess I can give it to everybody. It's a CUP30. So if you go to Columbia University Press, if, if you put in Banking on Freedom, uh, usually the first, one of the first sites to come up is either the Amazon site or the Columbia University site. So if you go on the university, um, Columbia University site, and you click it at, when you get when you're in your after you go to the um, cart, you can just put in C as in Columbia, U as in University, P as in Press, and the number three thirty three zero, and you can save thirty percent off. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. And giving us this information, you inspire us uh, to do things that we need to do ourselves. Uh, yeah. You gave us a kind of a plan, a game plan, that we should be following. But I'd like for you to emphasize again the importance of voting and why there is so much resistance uh, to keep black folks from voting uh, throughout history. Mm -hmm. And I think we should hear that again because it's important because a lot of folks haven't gotten it yet, the importance of it. And your next step, which is not only the right to vote, but to get out to vote. Right. Okay. 
Yeah, I think that, um, well, the resistance has been, you know, rooted in, um, you know, just ideas about, you know, racism and sexism um, and um, the important kinds of issues that um, marginalized people focus on are the kinds of issues that, you know, trouble, you know, people uh, sometimes uh, in power. And so they, uh, I think people have worked really over the years to try to keep the voices um, of marginalized people, not just people of color, but also poor people, um, disabled people, um, uh, all kinds of vulnerable people from exercising um, their, their, their right to vote. And so some of the voter repression kinds of um, activities that we see um, um, going on are, are things that we should um, really be cognizant of. And instead of thinking, I think sometimes um, I, I, one of my Uber drivers one time uh, was talking, because I'm from Texas, and he says, oh, you know, people in Texas, we really got to get them out to vote. And so they should just, you know, get their driver's license and go out to vote. But, you know, some of the tactics are really designed to, to keep or uh, to um, discourage some of the most vulnerable um, people from um, doing the kinds of things, the kind of trying to um, tackle the obstacles that are put in their way um, to vote. And uh, many young people, yeah, or I constantly have to tell my my students to get out to vote. I give them extra credit if they register to vote. <laughs> Um, and then they get also extra credit if they tweak them, if we have an election and they tweak themselves, vote. I don't care who they vote for. I just want them out um, and active. Um, but I do think that we just have to just really encourage, um, especially our young people, to remember not just the struggles that people, you know, have um, uh, suffered or undergone in order to, so that we have this right to vote, but that the issues are like, are, are these long standing issues about justice and opportunity that we all that we need that um, we are talking about the well-being of the nation as a whole not one particular group over another and also again to remember that just voting is like only the first step you know that we have to continue to you know talk to our um, our leaders and uh, talk to each other and inform each other about the um, issues um, that are really pressing uh, for us as well. Hello. Hello. Thank you again for coming. All right, you look I'm, really good in that red. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm speaking, I'm going to speak as a retired educator. Mm. And as a child who grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and graduated in 1964 from Armstrong High School, one of the two black schools in in Richmond at the time. Okay. Um, my concern is, as I look around, I see older folks who are here. <laughs> Tell me, please, how much involvement do you have in the schools? I'm talking about in the public schools, not in universities. Mm -hmm. In the public schools. Because it concerns me as I was listening to much of what you were saying, I'm saying to myself, some of this I know. I knew about Maggie Walker because that was in the <laughs> school. But some of this I know. But some of it I did not know, and I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s. So I want to know what exactly is being done to bring our young people, black and white, mm -hmm. up to par in terms of the information regarding voting and, and suffraging for, for uh, black folks? Um, I, am, I, I talk to my friends who teach in um, secondary and elementary school, and they talk about you know, bringing, you know, highlighting suffragists and, and voting. But I, I'm also like really trying to encourage um, some of my colleagues in, because there's like, a, there's, for example, there's a grant. Um, that you can get from teachingtolerance.org. Um, but I think it's just for like Mississippi, Louisiana, and maybe a couple of other states. Um, but it, it, they, will, they, will, they will give teachers up to $2,000 for they and their students to just become engaged in trying to encourage um, 17 and 18 year olds, people who will be 18, uh, about to be 18 when it's time to vote, to, um, to vote. And also to encourage students 
you know, even people who aren't able to vote, to just uh, encourage them to be more mindful of the kinds of um, activities. So um, I, I really like the idea of that grant, one, because I imagine that it's probably not that hard to get, um, but also because I like the idea of young people trying to figure out for other young people the kinds of ways to reach um, each other. Um, so the teacher, I'm hoping, you know, the teacher, we're the ones who would, you know, that they would buy for the money, but to just give the, the give the opportunity to the students to do whatever it is that they, they want to do. So I know that a teacher friend of mine in Oxford High School, um, you know, the, the, her students are, you know, uh, thinking about um, doing public service announcements. And then one of my students who became a teacher, I have like a, a, at least three, four students that I can think of who became, well, I have a lot more, but four that I'm like still in contact with who became teachers. Um, she um, got her master's like in documentary filmmaking. So she's, you know, having her students um, talk to, like do oral histories um, and produce these little mini documentaries, mini, doc, mini docs to, you know, share, um, but share. And so, you know, I don't, I'm hoping that it will encourage, you know, more 18 year olds to vote, but I'm also hoping that for those young people who aren't able to vote or won't be able to vote for quite some time, that it ignites their imaginations, you know, and sparks their excitement about the voice you know, that they have. So that's one kind of initiative. And I'm sure that, you know, other students and teachers probably have really great ideas about other ways to encourage um, students to um, kind of get involved. But, but how is it, how is it advertised to the school? How are schools aware that these grants are getting exist? Yeah. Well, see, I saw it I mean, because of oh, social media, and then I sent it to all the you know people, and I actually emailed it to other people. Um, but uh, if you are active on social media, you could just probably um, kind of be aware of uh, some of the organizations that uh, probably would be really active uh, in um, helping to spread the word about the voting and uh, check up with those people to see, um, are they willing to, you know, um, uh, send people to local schools, um, uh, people in your community, your neighbors, and in your church, of course, your organization, a church here, um, to, as a way to just, um, even with no money at all, to talk to each other and try to, you know, uh, think of ways to um, engage our young people in, um, you know, trying to, to think about their um, political future. I hope that works. <laughs> Dr. Garnett Scott, I too thank you for being with us here in Louisa. I have two questions. The first one I wanted to ask were, did you, in your research, did you find any documentation of black women being lynched for their political action? And my second thought as I sat here and listened and thought about how did I know some of those facts that you were throwing out at us? And I began to think about the people who are in this room and where we went to school. Mm -hmm. And I thought about the names of our school. I went to George Washington Carver Regional High School over in 15 near Culpeper. And some people, maybe if they were in Charlottesville, went to Jackson P. Burroughs. And mm -hmm. down here in Louisa, you went to A.G. Richardson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But then as we progress and we yeah. get successful, we don't have those schools anymore. Mm -hmm. We have Orange County High School, Culpeper High, and all of those things. And even the little elementary schools had some names that meant something. Mm -hmm. So even when you went past them, you asked, who was the Morton lady mm -hmm. that school was founded for? And Mrs. Despot, I hope I got that part right. Mm -hmm. And if you ride past George Washington Carver, well, who was that? At least you can tell the story of the peanut. But we've lost those things. As we become more successful, we want to look like everybody else. And we've forgotten the past. And the bottom line is, we've written ourselves out of the history, and we don't study anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I say to us, and, and it's a passionate thing for me, because we are part of a group that we are trying real hard to put that history back. And it's not just his story. 
it's our story too. Mm -hmm. And if we put it together, it's one shared story that we got. Mm -hmm. And so we're working, we really want to do that. But we can't sit back and expect somebody else to do it for us. Mm -hmm. And so we got to tell our children. Right. Sororities and fraternities make you learn the history of yeah. the very church to rail <laughs> and all those things. And so now we find out that, you know, they're hazing and doing all the things that don't allow anybody to walk in the lines and cross mm -hmm. the hot sands and all mm -hmm. of those things. <laughs> but we've got to do part of that ourselves. We got to teach that history in our own homes and teach it in our churches. Because if you think about it, that's where the education for our people began in the church mm -hmm. and in the schools the church is formed. Yes. So I say that as a passing statement. I ask anybody to join because we want to help develop those histories in the communities, in the schools. And now I'll go back to my question. Mm -hmm. Are any black women lynched because of this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, they are. They were. And you can also, you can, because I know you do, you know, genealogy and those people that are searching for their own family histories. And so the, the information is there. So now uh, even lay people or non-academic people have access to it with these kind of newspaper databases. And then also um, in Google Books, you know, they often have those really old, old books um, with, uh, you know, uh, for example, there's a, um, a federal investigation of the KKK from like eight, the 1870s, but 1870, that you can think, you can read all three volumes online and you can read people's testimonies about um, uh, the violence uh, against them. And you can also, um, I'm sorry, do you mind going one? Oh, Carlene isn't right. there. <laughs> One more. Um, uh, and, you, and you can also, I mean, there are also so many great books. There's so many great um, documentaries, um, et cetera. But yeah, if you uh, are interested in kind of the, in, in, under, in trying to bring out or, or, or learn more about um, you know, lynching or extra legal violence, I can definitely um, give you some, um, some work. I'm sorry, would you do one more? And they did ask me to do a, um, a reading list. And so, of course, I wasn't thinking as, as a, it's a virtual reading list. But if you go to that website, it's basically bit.ly, uh, bit but I, I gave it at least a name, hopefully you can remember, which is Louisa Reading List. And so it has some books on that list. It also has some links um, as well. And I tried to put books that I thought you might find, you know, really um, interesting um, for example, there's a Never Caught um, by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. It's about Ona Judge, um, an enslaved woman of George Washington. And she spent her lifetime basically running from her. And, and Erica says that the publisher asked her, well, can you name it something else? And she said, well, no, because um, she never was free. She was always, uh, she, she never was free. She just was never caught. Um, because she spent her life, you know, just in fear of, of being um, uh, found. So I tried to put, uh, there's a graphic novel in there. So for young people, especially about Nat Turner, there's a great uh, graphic novel about Nat, Nat Turner by Carl Barker. So if you have young people who maybe don't want to read a book book, then they can at least you know, look at the, this kind of comic book, um, which won an award. So there, um, so there are works on there about African-American um, women, Links to um, websites as, as well. The SNCC uh, Digital Gateway is an excellent site um, with testimonies, actual um, letters and, and, and papers and interviews and all kinds of um, firsthand um, source material about the operations of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other groups uh, in the 1960s. So um, if you go to bit.ly, uh, Louisa reading list, um, then you can see, you can copy it, you can download it, you can share it, um, you can do um, all of that. And I'll also be sure to just send Carlene a link and, and you can also always get it from her. Yeah, time yes. for one more question. <laughs> um, I hope you can hear me okay with this. Yes, I am a retired uh, public school teacher from New Jersey. Mm. There's two things. Uh, Number one, I can tell you that teaching tolerance uh, is available to all of yeah. us. Uh, they do reach out to public schools. Uh, I was able to access teaching materials mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis from them. 
So that's the good news. Um, what I'm concerned about is what I found in my own education as a teacher, uh, my teacher education from many, many years ago, as well as over the years mentoring uh, student teachers and incoming young teachers, is that there is something lacking in teacher education in our universities and colleges uh, when it comes to anything to do with um, teaching tolerance, with uh, black history, with um, all, all that entire field. Um, and I wonder what, what your experience is and what you think we might be able to do about that. Yeah, I've done some teacher workshops um, in um, Mississippi, and I've had teachers tell me that when, especially uh, when they try to or want to bring it up, some you know issues about you know uh, African American history or Native American history, um, or Latinx history, history that sometimes their administrators say, "Oh, that's divisive." Um, um, uh, we're trying to, you know, we, don't, we bring people together. We don't want to, uh, you know, cause any trouble. But the truth is that those histories are really, they're not separate histories. They are the history of the United States, the search for democracy and freedom. I mean, that's a story of that unifies people, not a story that divides them. Um, and so um, those teachers, though, have told me that they uh, just have really hard times with, you know, state um, requirements that they teach certain things, um, that they have uh, administrators that um, watch them or monitor them in their rooms and they have to teach uh, certain things. So it's just a, um, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. But I think that especially one of the great lessons, you know, from these women is that we use all kinds of spaces, not just classrooms, but churches and, um, you know, club spaces and, and, and to try to reach uh, our young people, you know, uh, where they are and, and in our homes and um, to kind of bring this rich history. And, you know, I didn't, but I will add some children's juvenile literature. I'm going to say children, juvenile literature um, as well, because they have some great new um, works out uh, to help appeal to, um, to our young people. So thank you all so much. Thank you. I just wanted to take a few moments on behalf of the Historical Society to express our gratitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so thank you to each and every one of you for spending the afternoon with us. Um, we really appreciate you coming out, and I want to say that we are honored that Dr. Garrett Scott um, traveled to Louisa to share her expertise that she has been gathering for years and years through hard work with us. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank um, the First Baptist Church and Pastor Jones and Lisa Gilliam, who I know can't be here today because it's her birthday, so happy birthday to Lisa. <laughs> for helping to coordinate and arrange this and partner with us and, and, and open up your church and, and welcome us. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that we received financial support for this project from Virginia Humanities and the Charlottesville Area of Community Foundation. And for those of you who are not aware, the Historical Society is now in our third year of working on an oral history project that has been funded by this grant from the Charlottesville Area Community Foundation. Um, and so I think that what the project we're working on kind of speaks a little bit to what the Q&A section was talking about. So we've been spending a couple of years collecting oral histories on what it was like in Louisa County in the 1950s. And from the start of this project, it has not been our goal to just collect these things to sit on a shelf. It's to get it out there in the community and reach out however we can to, to teach people about what life was like in this community. Um, and so already I've had the opportunity to work with some high school students from Louisa County um, Schools. Alex in the back being one of the interns that I got to work with and they listened to the oral history interviews and they created a short documentary. Um, and during that, that journey, it was really rewarding to work with these students, teach them about the 1950s and see just how completely different that time period is from from their reality. Um, and so that documentary, if anyone is interested in seeing it, 
is on display right now at the Sargent Museum. It's part of our current uh, temporary exhibit on Louisa County during the 1950s. Um, we do have a program tomorrow at the museum from 1 to 4, so it will be open if anybody wants to go see that exhibit or that documentary. Um, and just a few nuts and bolts things to finish it off before we go eat some sweet treats. Um, there is an evaluation in your program. We do greatly appreciate if you do fill it out. It helps us with future planning. Um, our volunteer and program assistant, Lene, will be traveling through the aisles if you need a writing implement. Um, and uh, as Dr. Garrett Scott said, she will be sending me that reading list. And Alex uh, has volunteered his time today to film today. And so we will make this available online. So if you know of anyone who wasn't able to make it today and you want to share this information with them, that's, that's the way to do it. So stay tuned on our website. Um, and that is all that I have for you. So I look forward to, to talking to all you at the reception. And thank you so much for coming out.